My name is Dustin Kelly, but everybody calls me DJ. I'm prior Army, serving as both a Ford Observer and a military police officer. I spent the last 14 and a half years as a police officer and detective in a large metropolitan police department. Two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the DTD Podcast. This week in the studio, my guest story is one of the humble beginnings that could not deter him from chasing his dreams. After high school, he started as a military police officer in the Navy. My guest held a burning desire to become a Navy SEAL since the tender age of 12, and that aspiration would come to fruition in the aftermath of the life-altering events of 9-11. My guest is more than a retired United States Navy SEAL. He's a highly decorated hero with multiple deployments to volatile landscapes of the Middle East. After two decades of serving with unwavering loyalty and honor, he embarked on a new mission. He founded ComSafe AI, a groundbreaking technology company dedicated to eradicating toxic communication and behavior within large enterprises and the Department of Defense. In his remarkable story, we find not only the embodiment of resilience and dedication, but also the profound message that unwavering commitment, one can achieve their dreams and continue to make meaningful impact long after the uniform is hung up. Join us as we delve into the life and wisdom of this exceptional individual who exemplifies the true essence of service, leadership, and innovation. Please welcome into the studio, Ty Smith. What's going on, my friend? How you doing, brother? Thanks for having me today. Yeah, man. I'm so glad you're here and that we get to talk about this. Uh, so much stuff that you've done, so many places that you've been, and it all comes, like I said, from humble beginnings. When we look back on your childhood, East St. Louis, you grew up poor. Uh, you you talk about just living in the neighborhood, what you had to watch out for, what you paid attention to, that education wasn't an important thing. But at the age of 12, you decided that you definitely wanted to be a Navy SEAL. You wanted to do something with your life. Can we talk about your youth? Talk about how your mom raised you. Talk about the family. And then if there's any kind of history with the military or law enforcement. Yeah, sure. So growing up in East St. Louis, um, I didn't have a lot. My family didn't have a lot. And, you know, as, as you can imagine, a uh, really big family. So my mom was one of, gosh, I think 11 kids total that my grandmother and my grandfather raised and most of of those children were women so i have nine aunts and growing up in east st louis illinois in in the early 80s um, most of my aunts were single mothers and so you know that left myself and and my siblings and my cousins that were my age to you know the devices of the surroundings and and that type of community, whether it be the streets or some people turn internally and really focus on just being with their family. Um, But I was a normal 12 year old kid, just like most kids at that time. And I just wanted to, to be happy. I was playing football growing up. I was wrestling growing up. I wasn't very good at at football. I found uh, my talent and, and the power of one when I started wrestling, but more than anything, I always knew there was something about me that just wanted me to get out and see the world. And because, you know, my mom was a single mom, just like most of my aunts, you know, I didn't really have anyone that was really hammering home the importance of an education and and preparing for, for higher education after high school. Um, I was just trying to make it through high school. I didn't even take the SAT or the ACT exams my senior year of high school because going to college just never even crossed my mind at that point. But like you said, I had a dream of becoming a Navy SEAL since I was a 12-year-old little kid. Uh, I watched the movie Navy SEALs when I was 12 years old with my mom, and and that was what what hooked me, seeing Charles Sheen and and all those actors doing all that crazy stuff. I said, man, that's what I want to do when I grow up. And since I didn't have anything... Uh, when I was graduating high school at the age of 17, I didn't have any colleges to look forward to or anything other than that. I just knew I didn't want to stay at home in East St. Louis. 
and mom was a cop. A lot of her friends were cops. So I was used to hanging around those types. I had a few uncles that had been in the military. Both of my grandpas were World War II vets. And so I came from a family um, of servant leaders, even though we didn't have a lot of, of material items, we didn't have a lot of money. We were wealthy on, on love and community. And so that's the kind of family that, that raised me. So I knew that I wanted to get out of East St. Louis and I wanted to go serve and I wanted to go make something of myself. And unfortunately, the Navy took me. Here's the part to me when you talk about leaving there after you graduate and that college wasn't even an option to you. And then fast forward all these years ahead and looking at, at the education that you've done, the boards that you sit on, the, the education that you take a part of, it makes me wonder, were you living to your full potential or did you even know your full potential back then? Because becoming a Navy SEAL is definitely a, a, a hefty goal to reach. But do you think you shortchanged yourself a little bit back then? To be honest with you, I think the answer to both of those questions is yes. Uh, because first and foremost, growing up in a place like that, um, like I said, I didn't have a lot of male role models to look up to. I didn't have, I didn't have an accurate picture of what success actually looked like. I had no idea what my potential was. And so when I was growing up and going through school, like I, I don't even think I ever even tried, brother, when it comes to, to school, uh, because it just wasn't that important to me. I, I didn't learn that it was important enough that I really need to apply myself the way I was trying to apply myself to football, the way I was trying to apply myself uh, to wrestling. I was just living uh, a day at a time. And so there was no way in the world I was living my potential uh, because I didn't even know what my potential was. And I didn't have like that coach or that mentor to have those conversations with me, you know, because my dad wasn't around. I can remember the first time I got into a street fight as a kid, and I think I was like seven or eight, maybe nine. Um, and I got my ass kicked pretty good. And I remember going home uh, to my house where my mom and, and my stepdad and my siblings were. Um, and I can look back on that time and go, oh my gosh, like I had nobody to actually sit me down and go, hey, like, okay, this is what this means it's okay these things happen this is how you think about this moving forward you know this is how you carry yourself these are the types of conversations you might have with this individual um just all of these lessons that could have been learned from that particular situation for example i didn't learn any of them because i didn't have that mentor or that coach or that father figure that was talking to me about that kind of stuff let alone giving me you know guidance on hey, you need to start looking at your life in seasons. You need to start looking five years, 10 years ahead uh, from now and planning backwards from there. So the answer to both of those questions is no, and I just didn't know any better. Coming from where you come and the neighborhoods, how you describe them growing up, I don't think a lot of people looked in five and 10 year increments there. <laughs> they were surviving day to day. And I've heard you talk about just surviving day yep. to day. Now, the, the part that I told you before, you know, when we talk that, that kind of I'm trying to put the puzzle pieces together. You have a mom that's a cop. You have a stepdad there. So I'm trying to figure out that dynamic of why mm -hmm. there really wasn't someone there to tell you like, hey, this is the wrong thing to do. Hey, maybe we want to go down this path. And I can, I guess, almost write it off as a stepfather. But the mom being a cop is where it starts kind of breaking apart for me. Yeah, sure. That's a, a, a good question. It's a really fair question. And um, I'm, uh, I'm an open book. So I'm, I'm willing to talk about anything, especially things that have happened in my past, because I think that all of those experiences, the good and the bad, led to me being the person that I am today. And so my mom was married to my stepfather for about eight years. Um, it, it's no secret that that me and my stepfather did not get along at all. Uh, and during that time, that they were married, uh, we had a pretty toxic relationship, um, what I would call um, a very inappropriate and abusive uh, relationship. So um, he was not a teacher to me. He was not a mentor to me. Um, he was my tormentor uh, more than anything, you know? And so when I actually wrote about uh, the story I was just talking to you about, 
I didn't say what I just said. I didn't say, you know, I went home and I didn't have anyone to talk to me about these things. What I said when I wrote was, you know, I went home to more abuse, you know, not just having someone that could talk me through this and go, hey, it's okay. Like, no, it doesn't mean you're less of a man or on and on and on. But no, I went home to more abuse. And so during that time she was married to him, uh, yeah, I I still didn't have anyone. Um, My uncles did a decent job of of trying to to coach me when and where they could and and even my stepfather's brothers uh, went out of their way to try to spend time with me i can remember times honestly each of them pulling me aside and just flat out going i don't like your your stepdad i know that's my brother but i don't like how he's raising you i don't like the way he treats you i see that stuff um and now that i'm older and i can look back on all the times they were coming over to pick me up or take me someplace to spend time with me, I can look back on it and go, gosh, those dudes were trying to protect me. That's what they were trying to do. And my goodness, I really appreciate that. And then my mom, uh, with her being on the, the police force, and <laughs> you know how much money uh, y'all make. Um, it isn't a lot. You know, she was working, gosh, 16, 17, sometimes 18 hours a day. And my stepdad was working too primarily during the day uh, when I was at school. And so a lot of times when my mom was at work at night, you know, out in the street city, St. Louis, uh, myself and my little sister and my my baby brother at the time, who was my stepfather's only biological child uh, in the family, we would be at home with him. Uh, hence, you know, just a plenty of, of days and nights of, of just unhappy childhood uh, for me. And, you know, my mom wasn't perfect, uh, but she was a good mom. She did what she could, but she worked a lot, a tremendous amount. Um, And like me, and I'm, she's probably where I get this from, but she obsessed over being a cop. You know, just like when I was a a teen guy, that, that was my whole life. I obsessed over it. Nothing came before that. And the same thing you know, with how I build companies now, I've just matured a little bit. And I, I've learned to like, no matter what, put your family first. But when I was younger, like, no, it was all about deploying overseas and shooting bad people in the face. And that was all I wanted to do. Um, so it was challenging uh, not having that person, uh, you know, the, the person that, that my kids have to be able to sit down and have difficult or uncomfortable conversations with in order to understand things in life that you're not supposed to understand when you're a seven-year-old kid, but you should have somebody to talk to about it. I guess the question to me would be, if you don't have that father or you only have those guys coming in every once in a while, my first question to that would be, how do you learn how to be a man? And then to build from there, it's a very manly thing to do, especially what you're going to do later on. But are you ever really sure in your mind, like, yeah, this is what a man's supposed to do. This is because you talk about your kids, you talk about marriage and all those kind of things. How do you figure that out later on in life? Like, yeah, I'm doing it right. Because some people have nothing to go off of. So they're just guessing, yeah, I'm doing it right. And who knows if they are. Gosh, that's a fantastic question. Um, Something that I think about all the time now, something that I'm currently writing about. I had nurture. For the most part, I, I had, you know, the, the dudes I was running around in the streets with. And fortunately, you know, my immediate friends, they were good kids, too. You know, they were just trying to stay out of trouble, too. Um, and, the, and they had good parents for the most part. Um, so it's not like I was hanging out with a bunch of knuckleheads that were teaching me to break in people's houses and stuff like that. Thank God. But make no mistake, there were there were plenty of, of, of older guys in the neighborhood that all of us young kids looked up to. Uh, that were doing plenty of things that I'm really glad I didn't follow their footsteps to do those things. And you know what? I learned from them too. To be completely honest with all of you, I learned from those guys too. I learned some good lessons from those guys. I learned bad lessons from those guys. Some of those guys um, were doing bad things, but they would flat out refuse to allow me or any of my friends to be around any of that stuff uh, because they wanted us to be more. Um, And then again, I'll come back to my uncles and those guys are really really important to me especially considering the fact that only one of them is still alive and that was my uncle kelvin who was an army veteran uh, my uncle poochie we all call him poochie since i was a little three-year-old little boy which is 
I think three or four is when he met my aunt, Sept Septoria, my mom's sister, uh, when he was still in the army. And that's when they married and they've been married ever since. Um, and he was always someone that I looked up to because he was in the army. He always treated us really good, more than fairly. He was the guy that would come and pick me up on the weekends from time to time, take me fishing. Uh, he was the guy that would show up to my football game sometimes just so I would have a male figure there. Uh, and he was always fair. And he was always there um, for my younger cousins, his his children. And more than than anyone, I mean, I, I would have to say he and a couple of my, my late uncles were the guys that I really learned from. And the last thing I'll say about that is... One of the most important things that I learned from my uncles was how to interact with women and how to how to be a man around women. You know, you you would never see ever one of my aunts and one of my uncles getting ready to walk in a room, you know, and, and one of my uncles would, would go first. You would never see that. Like even for their sisters, they would open the door or pull out a chair. You know, they were given plenty of hard times too, just like everybody else. But uh, I learned that stuff from those guys. But as far, as far as having, you know, again, someone like the father that I try to be to my kids, even when I'm not with them, you know, Ty and Tyler, they moved back to Illinois halfway through the pandemic. Uh, but I still got to be their dads, you know, they're grown ups now, but I still got to be their dad. And I got to make sure that I'm at least available all the time. What, what's going on? What do you need to talk about? What do you need? Uh, whereas I didn't have that. I've tried to do as good a job as I possibly can of, of drawing a roadmap to some kind of successful life for them to follow. Whereas again, I, I didn't really have that. I was sort of winging it and going uh, on my gut and my gut just told me to get out of East St. Louis. Uh, and, and again, I graduated high school, went down and saw the native recruiter and he's pretty much like, get me on the next thing smoking. So I think here would be the hardest question of this, of your childhood. And it's kind of where we'll step away from it. You talk about what you took from your uncles and things like that, but there's two people in there that I think that you did take something from, and that's your dad and your stepdad, whether it be mm -hmm. good or bad, you had to take something into life. And I almost feel that that would be part of the thing that drives you through your training, through your career and things like that, because you never had that to be proud of or anything like that. And I could be over guessing it, but. Oh, you're nailing it. In fact, um, I was up at the University of Southern California, Marshall Business School two or three weeks ago, um, talking with the MBB cohort, the Master of Business for Veterans program up there, the, the, the Veteran MBA program the same program that I did when I was retiring. And at the end of my talk, the director of the program, he asked me, you know, he said, Ty, what's, 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 what's driving you to go out and do all this stuff and, and to, you know, you're building these, these companies and like, you're working extremely hard and like, like what's driving you and like, not the profession, not the personal thing, but the professional thing. Like, well, like, what is it? And I said to him, I said, James, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't think it's professional. I think it's personal what's driving me. Um, I will tell you, I have imposter syndrome with the best of them. My nightmare is becoming my biological father. That is my absolute nightmare is, is becoming, is failing at what I'm doing. And then having people look at me and go, oh, that dude was just out talking shit. He, he wasn't really doing or trying to accomplish any of that stuff. He was like, he was just out talking stuff, trying to make people think that that he was this person or he was that person meanwhile you know they had no idea the the countless hours i have, have spent my entire life you know building up to being the person that i am now and building you know what i'm building right now but that is absolutely my worst nightmare and i can remember times uh, when i was a little kid and my grandpa my my father's father you know, him looking down at me because my, my father's parents, like they were my best friends in the whole world. And I can remember several times him looking down at me, you know, just with this. And when I, I didn't understand it when I was a kid, but I get it now, the, the, the look on his face, like it was pain. He, he was hurt. 
Uh, and he would look down at me sometimes and say, I don't know why your father is this way. I didn't raise him to be this way, you know? Um, and he's right, he didn't, because he raised him, you know? Uh, but you're absolutely right. I, I learned from that. I learned how not to be. I learned how not to make those same mistakes. And I learned that I would never want someone to go through life without my support when they were owed my support. So you're right. Well, and another thing to that, when you talk about that and you say imposter syndrome and you say your biggest nightmare is to fail as a father, a businessman, whatever it is. But I think you would agree. There's a difference in trying and failing and then yes. just not even trying at all. Absolutely. And I think that the other side of that imposter syndrome for me is ego. And that's something that I've also been working tremendously hard on over the last year, not killing my ego. I'm not even taming my ego because sometimes you need your ego, right? Just gaining more control over my ego because I say that my worst nightmare is, is becoming my biological father, right? And, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, that, like what I know of him and a little bit of times that I did spend with him, like that was very much so him, like just all talk, 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 but no action, no completion of, of anything. And so the other side of that for me is, is you got ego over here, you know, going, hey, the, you don't want these people to to think poorly about you when in all actuality, you have been working your ass off over here. And I've been battling with myself, uh, especially over the last year, trying to understand why those thoughts are even important to me or why the thoughts of other people are even important to me. And I, and I haven't answered that yet. I think a part of it is just because of who I am. I care, I care about people. I care about doing what I say I'm gonna do. And I care about being honest with people, but make no mistake, the other half of that imposter syndrome is my ego. I don't want to look foolish. Uh, more than anything, I don't want to look dishonest. I, I don't want people, because that's what I feel when I think about my biological father, right, is, is dishonesty. Um, and that's something that I don't ever want to be associated with. And so, yeah, my ego drives a lot of that too. And then lastly, you know, we've talked about it a little bit. Growing up in East St. Louis, my family never had anything. Not really. You know, we, we had a lot of love for, for ourselves and, you know, fortunately our, you know, our parents figured out how to keep food in our stomachs and, and a roof over our head and clothes on our back. And, and, and that is a lot right there because a lot of people uh, have a hard time with that. But my family never had much. And the life that I live now, you know, my beautiful beach home here in Coronado, uh, San Diego, California, is, is night and day compared to how I grew up, you know, that's how good God is. And so when I consider, you know, how I grew up and, and what home is like, and the fact that all of my family is still there for the most part, or I'd say 97% of my family is still there in the South side of Chicago and in nearly the same situation as we were in when I grew up. And I want to be careful of, of how I say that. Uh, because make no mistake, I had extremely hardworking um, aunts and uncles and, and people in my family that that are really hardworking people. But, you know, they're they are typical middle America, hardworking, you know, middle class or just below middle class American people. You know, they don't make a bunch of money. These are people that make, you know, 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars a year. Maybe it's my ego, maybe it's the imposter syndrome, maybe it's just the center of my heart. But I want all of my family, especially my nine aunts, that sacrificed a tremendous amount to make me the person that I am today. I want them to experience what it's like to, to live the way that I live now. And so that's another reason why I work so hard to become successful is because I want to share that success with them. Because they gave me and made up what my biological father wasn't around to, to give for me. Well, let's move on into your career. You graduate from high school and this is where I think right off the bat, you start showing potential. You join your military police. You do that for about four and a half years. Now, the interesting part of this to me was you were also an Italian translator. 
and you were like the base Italian translator. So it's not like you're, you're in Sardinia, Italy. That's not an easy thing to do. So right off the bat, and this is where your story jumps back and forth on me. You say, I didn't even try in high school. I just did this to get out of there. And then once you're given the opportunity, you're like, yeah, I'll learn another language. No big deal. And I'll translate. Let's talk about that, how that blooms itself in right off the bat. Yeah. So, I mean, man, I, I don't think I was ever a dumb kid. Um, I don't think I was ever very, very smart either. I just, again, I just, I only knew what I knew at the time. And so I was just taking life kind of day at a time. Uh, but when I joined the Navy, that was all it took for me was to just be surrounded by other people that wanted to do some stuff, right? Just be surrounded by other people that, that cared about other people and went like, Hey, let's go serve. Let's go do good things with our lives and let's go learn some stuff and be a part of this and hang out with these people. That was all it took. And once I had that, don't get me wrong, like it was also up to me to take initiative a lot of the time, but I'll be honest with y'all, like it, it wasn't that difficult to take the initiative to go and do all of the awesome stuff that I did because I was surrounded by awesome people that were teaching me that taking the initiative to go build stuff should be your default, right? And so I was simply just emulating the people that, you know, I was surrounded by, I looked up and I was like, well, I, I don't know who all these people are. And I'll be completely honest with you. I've never even been around this many white people at once but this is where i am this is my life now and i'm gonna live it and i'm gonna have fun and so i at least i was at least smart enough to know to be open-minded right and so when i got to italy the day the first day i landed in the rome airport uh just being honest here i, I think i was 18 years old and i looked around that airport and and i saw probably the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in 18 years. Um, and I knew right then and there I needed to be able to talk to them. So that was what motivated me to go out and learn Italian. It wasn't because I wanted to be smart or, you know, I wanted to be the base translator, but it worked. That That's what caused me to want to go out and learn. And it was as simple as me just going out and talking to people and walking up to people in La Piazza and going, como se dice questo, como se dice questo. You know, how do you say this? How do you say that? And then once I got to the point, probably about eight and nine months in where, you know, I'm sitting around and reading, you know, fiction novels in Italian and watching television shows, uh, you know, on Italian TV, you know, one of my friends came up to me and was like, hey, you should, tell the base that that you speak Italian, like that they, they need a translator. And we had a couple of people that were doing it um, at that time already, uh, but that billet was only a two year billet. So people were coming in and out, in and out. Now you could extend and stay if you wanted, but unfortunately a lot of people, you know, they were closed minded when they got there and they were just in a hurry to get back to the United States. And so when I got the opportunity uh, to showcase what I could do, you know, the base took me up on it and I was given the opportunity and it was one of the coolest experiences of my life because I ended up working alongside the Italian uh, Carabinieri, the military police there. And they are the highest ranking police in all of Italy. It's not like in the United States where, you know, Amer American military police, they don't really have jurisdiction outside of the base, outside of the military. In Italy, the Carabinieri, they are it and you do exactly what they tell you to do or else, and they don't care who you are. And so I looked up, you know, and I, I've been in Italy for a couple of years. I've been working with the Italian Carignetti for a couple of years, and, and it kind of hit me like, gosh, you're being mentored by not just the American military police, but you're being mentored by the Italian military police too. In fact, most of my friends were Italian. And so, yeah, man, it was just, I was blessed enough that, you know, when I joined the Navy, I got stationed in this really cool place. And immediately I was surrounded by a completely different nurture than what I had been used to. And fortunately, I was open minded enough to take advantage of it. I want to point out something and, and follow me through on this thought. When you're talking about going over there, you said you'd never been around that many white people before. Mm -hmm. I want to know, honestly. Do you think you had a little bit of a chip on your shoulder when you went over there about that? Oh my gosh, a hundred percent. 
and it wasn't and it wasn't about being surrounded by a bunch of white people because I went to school, you know, with white people. I had white friends, but I got to Italy and I was like, oh my God, there's only like a few of me, right? <laughs> that was the first time I'd ever experienced that. And I absolutely had a chip on my shoulder, but you know why? Uh, it was because I was a young idiot because I was hanging out with other dudes that were my age and they knew that I had taken orders to Italy. And there were other dudes that looked just like me. Um, and all of them were going, oh my gosh, you're gonna hate it. Italian people are so racist. You're going to absolutely hate it. They're gonna hate you and blah, 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 blah. Because that's all they knew. And, and who knows where they heard it from or if they just made it up, right? And so when I got there, yeah, man, I, like I was, I was very standoffish, like I didn't, if people were staring at me the wrong way, I didn't really know what to think. You know, like a couple of times, you know, that young 18 year old temper would cause me to pop off and be like, hey, what are you looking at? And, you know, or people were like, they were just trying to figure me out. <laughs> Whereas I wasn't used to it, they weren't used to it either. And so they were literally just trying to figure me out, um, you know, uh, regardless of, of what they were thinking. So yeah, it took me a little bit to get used to that. And you know what did it? It was just talking to people going out and talk, como se dice questo? That was it. And people go, oh, you're trying to learn Italian. That's really, really cool. We appreciate that. Next thing you know, I've just made a new friend just because I tried to talk. So I put the guard down, stopped being scared and just went up and, and tried to talk to a complete stranger and asked him, how do you say this in your language? And so, yeah, it took me, it took me uh, probably about a good two to three months before I really opened up and was kind of like, man, those guys didn't know what they were talking about. I love this place. I don't want to, I don't want to leave. And I ended up staying there for almost five years because I meant it. I fell in love with that place and I didn't want to leave. And the only reason why I left uh, was because 9-11 happened. And a week later, my SEAL training package was approved. I'm glad you bring that up that it got kind of rushed through after 9-11 happened. Because the reason I ask about that, having a chip on your shoulder, I've heard you talk about when you go to training and you're in Navy SEAL training, and there's a very small number of people that look like you in Navy SEAL training at the time. And I think that's even how you described it when I heard you talking about yep. it. I think that wall went back up because when I hear you talk about it, so we got to, I got to understand that too, because you, you fall in love with this place. You see that, that you can thrive and you can do all these things. Then you move over to the seals. And I feel like that wall went back up a little bit. Am, am I right on that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and thank you for even noticing that. And I think that that is a characteristic uh, that all of us develop. And I think you develop that going through training because as soon as you get to training day, and especially considering when I went to training, when I showed up to SEAL training that night, like you, it, the air was thick, like the air was on fire. People were pissed off. And the dudes that were in training knew that there was a very high likelihood that, that if they successfully navigated the course, they were absolutely going to war. And so when I got there, um, you can imagine how little playing around was happening. And so when you're in SEAL training, you start learning day one. You trust your brothers. You trust the men to your left, the men to your right. Those are the people you trust. You don't even trust the instructors because they're going to play games with you. And they're going to try to get you to break and turn on the dudes to the, your left and right just to see if they can get you to do it. Um, so I, I say that's really where I started learning how to think super critically. And let me, I'm processing this for a second. I wouldn't say that my walls went back up when I got to SEAL training as a result of being only, you know, one of a few African American guys in the class. More than anything, I'd say my wall went up because I didn't know who was going to be there a week from there, let alone months from there. And so I kind of stuck to myself uh, at the very beginning. But after Hell Week, I started opening up and, and I got with like my little clique of dudes that that were my closest friends in the class. And and of that group, um, there's probably about 10 of us and only four or five of us were African-American, but the rest of those dudes were white. It wasn't until I got into 
the SEAL teams that the wall went way up. And that was a result of me, you know, getting into the community, being around the community, realizing that, you know, there were very few people that looked like me and that I would be reminded of that all the time, all the time. In most cases, it was okay and, and I didn't care, but in some cases, it wasn't okay. Um, and I did care and those dudes knew about it. Uh, when it happened, because I was just, I, I don't take shit. I'm going to tell you what's on my mind, whether my voice is shaken or not. And so I quickly learned that, hey, there's a way for you to thrive in this community. But make no mistake, like you're, it, it's going to be a little different for you than it is for some of your other teammates. I don't think that that is something that is a stain on the community as a whole. I think that one of the things I learned throughout my career in the SEAL teams is, just, is that just like every other group of people, whether you're talking about special operations commandos, law enforcement officers, black people, white people, orange people, it doesn't matter. You take a group of human beings, a certain percentage of that group is going to be rotten. And the larger your test you know, case, the larger your data set, the larger that group of, of cancer is going to become. And so I just learned, you know, who to hang out with, who to stay away from. Um, and I just, I learned that, you know, I, I always had to be on my P's and Q's because it was very easy um, for people to notice if I wasn't keeping up or if I went left when I should have went right. I mean, a lot of dudes would make it known. So yeah, the wall kind of went back up, but I think that's also a part of what made me the commando that I was. And I think that's a, a part of, of why I was, you know, as, as good as I was. And I was, wasn't even close to being the best SEAL operator. So many of my teammates were so much better than me, but I did pretty good. And I think that that wall actually helped me in a bunch of situations too. And to wrap up, well, at least to wrap up this part of the conversation, and I write about this a lot these days, I wrote about it this morning, that wall is still up. You know, because I, as an entrepreneur, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's an emotional roller coaster all day, every day. And you start learning that people rarely tell you exactly what they're thinking. People rarely tell you exactly what they're feeling. Um, and if you aren't a critical listener, if you aren't an active listener, it's very easy for you to hear what you want or think one thing when somebody actually meant something else. And so, more than anything, I've just tried to like find a, a better way of being in the middle. You know, my personality tends to be one of extremes. So I'm either extremely on the left or extremely on the right about something. And so I try, you know, to be more so in the middle so that I have the ability to, to walk on the top of that wall and just pop over to either side of it whenever it's convenient for me to do so. When you say that, and I want to play devil's advocate with you for a minute, you say that you had to watch make sure you didn't go left when you should have gone right. Don't you think though, in that environment that everybody has watched if they go left when they should have gone right, it is a meat grinder in there on a daily basis. And you were there, you know, you would know better than anyone, but it's a pressure cooker on a daily basis. Do you think there was that much difference? I mean, and I want your honest opinion, or do you sure. think that everyone gets that and you just maybe paid attention to it more? No, I think that's a totally fair question. And I do think that everybody got it because you're right. It's a goddamn meat grinder. Everybody right. is getting hammered. Uh, but in some cases, you know, some things do happen or things are said that do go too far. Um, you know, like that, like there, you know, there have been times where you should have went left and you went right and you're called the N bomb, you know, because you went right when you should have went left. Uh, and whether you, whether people are just trying to get in your head to see how you're going to react or not. I don't care how you paint it. That's wrong. There are better ways to get in my head and less effective ways to cause me to get in your ass. You know what I mean? So, um, no, it, it's a totally fair question, but it was different. It was. And that is coming from someone who, uh, and again, I, I'll try to be as fair as a person can be. I call a spade a spade. If you're wrong, you're wrong. I don't care what color you are. Um, I have opinions on you know, pretty much every one of the the white cop on, on, on black kid shootings that have taken place over the last year that caused people to go up in arms. 
And more than half of those I've had my own people tell me that I'm a sellout because I'm like, no, I saw it with the cop. It's very simple. The person should have complied, you know? So I try to be really in the middle, very, very fair. And you, you're just going to have to trust me when I say that it was different. So SEAL Team 8, 2004, you go to Afghanistan. We're three years removed from 9-11. You're probably a year and a half removed from training, if that. I mean, and you go to Afghanistan. Now, yeah. I want you, as much as you can, if you got to pause for it or whatever, sights, sounds, smells, feelings, you touch down in Afghanistan. You are now a Navy SEAL since 12 years old watching one of the most fantastic movies ever made, but you're there and you're doing it. I want to know everything you felt and if it all comes back to you right now when you think about it. <laughs> Great question. Fun question. Oh, my gosh. Man, I try not to spend too much time uh, in this fantasy land because it's so easy to live there and just never want to come back here because it was so much fun. My career in the, the SEAL teams for even for the bad days, even for some of the discomfort that we were just talking about, my career as a whole was a dream. And I can remember getting to Afghanistan for the very first time, uh, early 2003, I think spring 2003, um, as a brand new assaulter at SEAL Team 8. And I had been, and I wasn't like right out of buds and, and into Afghanistan, like it was about a year and a half. And so I was in deployment workup for that year and a half at SEAL Team 8 with my platoon excuse me. So I had a tremendous amount of training going into even that, that first deployment. I didn't have a bunch of experience, but I had a bunch of training and a lot of common sense uh, to rely on. And, and I had been shot at before on several occasions. <laughs> so uh, growing up in East St. Louis, right? So I was just like, well, at least I checked that box first. But I remember getting there um, and, and feeling like I just, I felt like almost like like this is a movie. I can't believe I'm here doing this. I'm finally going to get the chance to do what I've been dreaming of doing. And I mean, I was literally dreaming like every week as a kid of being a Navy SEAL. Every day I was in Italy training to go to budge training. I was dream like having stupid dreams of, you know, like running through aircraft carriers with a SEAL team, crazy stuff like that. And now I'm actually here uh, and getting to do it. I can remember uh, getting ready to go out on that first stop. I, dude, I was scared shitless. I was so scared. And I wasn't scared of getting hurt. I was scared of messing up because I had fantastic leadership uh, and I would do anything to please those guys. I had a phenomenal team. Unfortunately, some of those guys are dead now and I miss them every single day. They taught me a lot. They taught me a tremendous amount. They taught me how to stay alive. They taught me how to be a good operator. They taught me how to keep my humanity, even as an operator, where you know you you had plenty of opportunity to not be human uh, and to be an asshole. And they taught me how not to do that and how to not even think that way. Um, but I so I, I was I was afraid of letting them down. I was never scared of, of getting hurt, especially not in the beginning. I was just afraid of letting them down. I remember feeling, uh, because when we first got there, we got to, we, we flew in a Bagram Air Base um, and we operated out of uh, Bagram for a while. If I remember correctly, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was Camp Brian Olette because Brian Olette had been killed, I think like a, a year or so before that. Um, we were operating out of Camp Brown and let out of uh, Bagram Air Base. And there wasn't too much going on. There was a little stuff going on. But I just remember going out on the first op and feeling like I thought I was in shape. Like, wh why are these mountains whipping the shit out of me right now? I don't get this. Because that was the first time that I've been at that kind of altitude. I also wasn't taken into consideration because I was just a dumb kid, man. I think I was 22. Um, but I, I wasn't taken into consideration what was happening to me psychologically, because I think like my conscious brain was just like, yeah, I'm not afraid, whatever. I'm a gunfighter. I'm here to gunfight. But when I look back on it and, and with all of the thought and the, the research that I put into post-traumatic stress currently, because I have to live with it for the rest of my life as a result of all of those experiences, I also wasn't taken into consideration that 
hey, you weren't scared on the surface, but make no mistake, you were scared somewhere down in there. And that weighs on you too. I couldn't, I can't recall anything that made me feel uniquely special or or scared or or more than anything, I just felt alive. I felt like I was living my dream. I felt like I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. And I felt like I felt like I was cool. That's I, I was there to be a gunfighter and I was a gunfighter. But make no mistake, like I, I was nobody special. I was still a, a young, dumb, 22, 23 year old kid that didn't know his asshole from his elbows. And I was leaning on the guys to my left and my right that were way better than me, had way more experience than me to show me how to not get myself shot up or blown up. Well, when you say about being scared, but you were scared, you were scared of letting down your team. And no matter how you manifest fear, whether it's you're scared you're going to die or scared you're going to let the team down, fear is fear. And it's going to chemically put itself through your body in the exact same ways. You say that you were nothing. You weren't anything special. You were over there. Is there someone that sticks out in your mind from really taking you and showing you this is the way you do it right? Yeah. um, Gosh, thank you for asking that question. Yeah, his name is John Foss. Uh, Johnny Foss uh, was my bro. I was one of John's new guys. He was in that platoon with me at SEAL Team 8. I think it was John's second or third platoon. It was my first platoon. And Johnny was probably the most squared away Navy SEAL I ever met in my whole life. And you would look at Johnny and and you wouldn't imagine a Navy SEAL. And I wear Johnny and Kevin with me everywhere I go. Unfortunately, Johnny and Kevin both died on extortion 17 on August 6, 2011. And forgive me, I uh, it's hard for me to talk about uh, some of these things and some of these people because they meant so much to me. But Johnny, you would you wouldn't look at him and think he was a Navy SEAL. Like you, you look at him, just think like he's just average skinny looking redheaded white dude that is a nice guy and he's always smiling and he's like he's when he talks he sounds like he's incredibly intelligent like you would just never assume and this dude was one of the baddest dudes to ever walk this planet and i mean he was one of the baddest dudes to ever walk this planet and he was every bit as intelligent as you thought he was when he started talking and i remember that in particular being the most impressive thing to me about Johnny Foz. Every time I saw him, he was reading something. Every time I saw him, he was either working on his craft or he was reading about it or reading something uh, that caused him to be a better person, a better human being, a better operator, a better leader. Um, And I can remember one time in particular, I messed up. Uh, we were overseas and I got hurt and I ended up missing an operation because I was training in the gym and I got hurt, blew out my back or something like that. And I missed an operation as a result of it because I like had some nerves in my back were jacked up. And Johnny was pretty pissed at me because I had gotten into a, a discussion about it with one of the other guys who's giving me a hard time. And I didn't understand it at the time. Like, why are you giving me a hard time? Like, I, you think I wanted to get hurt? You think I wanted to miss this operation? Like, no, trust me, I want to go out and gunfight. I was trying to be in shape. That's what SEALs do. But again, I wasn't thinking critically enough. I also, I wasn't thinking about, yeah, man, but if you're being driven by your ego on the squat rack and you get hurt, now you can't go out and support the boys. Like, that's also not looking out for your team. Um, And Johnny explained that to me. He did so in a way after, you know, him witnessing me have this discussion with another one of our teammates who was senior to me. And I thought that he was kind of, taken it someplace that you and I were talking about earlier. Um, and I didn't agree with that. And so I, I said, okay, this isn't about this anymore. It's about this. Now you're going to deal with me. Not, not the, not the, the E5 seal. You're going to deal with me, the man now. Right. Um, and Johnny stepped in, separated us, took me out back, gave me a talking to, uh, that I deserved every little bit of it. And the part that I remember the most was uh, is at the very end of it, after he chewed my ass a little bit and told me about myself, he looked at me and he put his arms around me and he said, it's all right, bro. And he kept one of his arms around me as we walked back to the tent, smiling at me the whole way as though everything was fine and just talking about normal random stuff, just like that. 
he turned the switch on, he did his job, he laid down the hammer when he was supposed to, exactly how he was supposed to, just like that, he turned the switch off and said, here, now let's talk about this and let me help you grow. And uh, I'll never forget him for that. And I love him and I miss him. Yeah, that's all I have to say about that. In speaking about him, and you see that he's killed, is it already real to you, or is that the moment in your career where it becomes very real? Because the way you describe him, the most squared away guy, the baddest man on the planet, and when you hold someone to that standard, and then you see that anything can go wrong, anything can happen, does it put a little hitch in your step when you're thinking about it in your brain you're trying to process it you're trying to move forward you're trying to be this gunfighter that you said but then you look around and you go shit like it could happen at any moment how does that change things for you yes fantastic question so the answer to that is absolutely yes so i when johnny was killed on extortion 17 i had been in the teams for gosh i've been in for a while now gosh i've um, so I was on that deployment with them and I was working with one troop out of Jalalabad and, and those guys were over at, at Shank, um, two troop. And I think that was my fourth deployment. Yeah, that was, gosh, that was like my fourth deployment. So I had some experience, man. I'd been around um, for a while, at least 10 plus years. Um, I'd already experienced a good amount of loss. Um, I'd lost some teammates. I'd been through some stuff. So my mindset had, had totally changed. And it's it's no wonder your mindset changes when you see guys that you truly believe are better than you, truly believe are better than you and smarter than you in every way possible, just naturally talented at what you have to work your ass off to be okay at. When you see them get hurt or when you see them die, it's very easy for you to look at yourself and lose your confidence and go, oh my gosh, that could happen to him. Like, what's going to happen to my dumb ass? Uh, but that wasn't the mindset. That that wasn't the fear that evolved as a result of those experiences. The fear that evolved as a result of those experiences, in my opinion, was the good kind of fear. It was the really good kind, the kind that made you think twice before you just rushed into that room to your death. Right? Um, that was the kind of fear that that developed. And it didn't affect me, you know, per se in that like, yeah, sure. I learned from those things too. And like, I was also thinking twice before I, you know, started pieing that door, but it affected me in a way that I became even more hands-on, more intrusive um, as a leader and especially as a combat leader. And so I actually became harder on my boys when they made tactical decisions that I didn't agree with when I felt like, hey, you're not thinking this through. You're not thinking about the secondary and tertiary effects of your decision. Like me, when I was your age, you're only thinking a layer deep. I need you to think two to three layers deep, right? If you went left when you should have went right, what's going to happen after that? And then what chain of events is that going to set off, right? Um, that's how it evolved. It was never oh my gosh, like now I'm not that confident or maybe I shouldn't breach this threshold. It was more of, hey man, are you seeing the big picture before you breach that threshold? Because if you do and you go down, you're gonna put more of your boys behind you in danger because now they gotta come and get your shot up ass out of the room, right? So that was how that that evolved, but it wasn't something that, that would cause me to be paralyzed with fear or to to kind of second guess what I was doing. Um, it made me want to do it even more. It just made me want to be better uh, so that I could preserve the lives of my boys. How much better did it make you? And it's a sliding scale. But if you were to go, I was this before this happened, what did it put you on the backside of it? Well, I wouldn't say that it was like an instance that caused me to be better. Um, it was cumulative over time. And I had to make a bunch of mistakes just like everybody else um, before I got better. But I was also learning from the mistakes that were written in blood, you know, by 
other service members that had gone before me, just like everyone else was. I um, mean, so uh, again, I can't put a finger on any particular instance. It was just a lot of repetition and you're going to get it until you get it or you're out of here. You're going to keep up with us. And if you can't, you're out of here. And a lot of people don't understand that just because you get in the SEAL teams doesn't mean that you get to stay in the SEAL teams. Every day is a test. Five gunfights in, you're okay. You're doing okay. First gunfight, mm-hmm. you're a little nervous. Five gunfights in, 50 gunfights in, 100 mm-hmm. gunfights in. You talked about people teaching you how to be humane, how to keep that edge on you. But I don't give a shit who you are, and I don't care mm-hmm. what they say. Nothing, and you could probably ask your mom the same thing. Nothing will stop you from being jaded. I don't care how hard you try oh, to yeah. do it. You can't stop it from happening. So when we talk four, five, six deployments in, you lose your best friend. You lose your mentors. Let's see how it manifests itself in you with being jaded to the world. No, you're absolutely right. And and this is something that I think about it often, humanity and the fact that I was able to maintain mine and I taught my boys to do the same thing. And to this day, knock on wood, you know, none of my boys have been in trouble. None of they've had plenty of opportunities and they've continued going overseas and kicking the shit out of bad people. You know, even after I retired back in 2016, unfortunately, they've never been in trouble and they've never been accused of civilian casualty or anything even remotely close because I thought it was really important to teach them to maintain their humanity, just like Johnny and those guys taught me. Because someday, someday you're gonna get off the train and it's not gonna stop. You're gonna get off of it. My, my buddy, Eric Burks, retired master chief, said this better than anybody I, I've ever heard say it. You know, it was like being in a SEAL team is like being on a speed and bullet train, man. And, and that train never stops. And when you go to retire, like it might slow down just enough for you to jump off of it safely, but you get up, you dust yourself off and you look up and you're like, where the hell did my friends go? But they're 50 miles down the track already because that train's got to keep going. The mission must continue. And that's what I was constantly teaching my boys was that, hey, someday this fantasy land that we're living in, this dream that we're all living in is going to be over. And you are going to have to go back into the real world and you have to live a normal life with normal people. And I believed at the time, um, and I'm glad I believed that because I, I think it's worked out for me, that maintaining your humanity as a warfighter is a really, really important part of how we move forward with our lives after you transition out of the life of a gunfighter, whether you're in the military or whether you're in law enforcement, because we all lead jaded, exactly like you said, but we could do without that stuff that, that causes the conscience to go, Hey, you know, that was wrong, right? You know, somebody saw that, right? You're going to have to answer for that sooner or later, right? Someday you're going to be 45. You're not going to be 22. And you're going to be looking back on shit you did in your life because you're actually interested in just being better from this moment forward. And those are demons you're not going to be able to defeat. And you're going to be looking for answers in the bottom of the bottle and you're never going to find them there. And that's those are conversations I would have with my boys, those uncomfortable conversations I didn't hear anybody else having. And I was also having them with myself. And I think that it was really, really helpful. But make no mistake. I left the military probably more jaded than the average individual and going into entrepreneurship didn't help. I went from doing one really hard thing to doing an even harder thing in my opinion. Um, And that didn't help, but I didn't lose my faith in humanity and I still haven't and I still love people. I never, never, I was never one of those operators that was, oh, I, no, I, I don't like Arab people or all Muslims are, are, are bad or, or terrorists. So like, I, I just never even allow myself to think that like, it doesn't even sound right coming out of my mouth, you know, to, to even think that way for me, like that was no different from saying, Hey, all cops are racist. All black people are criminals. All Mexicans are illegals. It's just like, 
that all sounds stupid to me. But make no mistake, I was jaded. Um, I was very unhappy. I was very, what's the word I'm looking for? I was very disappointed with humanity. I was disappointed with humans. Um, and where it really caught up with me and, and where it really started to come out of me, believe it or not, was when we pulled out of Afghanistan the way that we did. Because it just brought it all back up to the surface for me. And I was reminded of how jaded I was and why. Now I know why. I'm so jaded because we just turned around and gave all that shit back to the people that we were killing for the last 20 years and that have killed my friends. And now we're, we're supposed to keep going this way and pretend like none of that ever happened. So yeah, I'm jaded because, you know, I got friends that died because they were believing in that agenda that y'all were pushing when you were having us go this way because we believed in it and we believe in America. And so we were doing this and now we look forward and you're, you're like, no, you have to keep going this way, pretending it never happened. And by the way, we're going to give all of this back to them. It still doesn't make me feel jaded to the point where I want to stop trying to be a better person myself or stop trying to improve the world. I'm going to keep doing that. But yeah, man, I'm just as jaded as everyone else. And I talk about that. I talk about people being jaded the most when it comes to law enforcement. Like when I'm having these conversations about like how human beings can be jaded is typically because I'm, I'm defending a law enforcement officer. And I talk about this with my friends a bunch, as you can imagine, my friends call me about this a bunch. Cause I'm, you know, a successful African-American guy. I'm the son of a cop. You know, I used to be a cop, you know, I was a reserve law enforcement officer, even when I was in the steel team. So they want to know like, Hey man, how does all this stuff make you feel? Um, and I talk to them about this stuff a lot. And like I said, I pissed off a lot of, you know, people that look just like me, family and friends, because they don't agree with my stance on, on this. But people also have to understand that cops are also human beings. And they, I think they can be jaded faster than anybody because day after day after day after day, they are dealing with morons. I mean, like the, the, the scum of the earth, the, the worst human beings that you can imagine, they have to deal with them all day, every day. And so it would be easy uh, to imagine how, well, so think about it this way. I think about it like the way I think about a gunfight. I have, dude, I've been in so many, I've been in well over 80 gunfights in my adult life. As you can imagine, by the, the end of my SEAL career, a gunfight pops off. I'm hearing the, the snap of, of a bullet breaking the sound barrier right past my face. And it's like, oh, they're shooting at us again. All right, you guys flank right. We're going to lay down some cover and fire. And like, we're going to crush these dudes. No big deal. Like, okay, I just got shot at again. No big deal. And, and you have to, like, I flip that on his head. And I'm like, now imagine being a law enforcement officer, black, white, brown, man, woman, it doesn't matter. And you're going into somewhat of the same scenario day after day after day. Eventually, you're probably going to show up to work and be like, well, time to go out here and deal with this, this dirt bag again that I'm being called to go and talk to because this is what I do all day, every day. And, and nobody ever talks about you know, the, the good stuff that cops do or, or the good interactions that they have with people, it's always the bad stuff. And so I, I try to remind people that, hey, cops are human just like everyone else. It's possible for them to be jaded just like everyone else. Do we expect them to not be human um, and do their jobs by the letter of the law and like stay within, you know, the, the, the left and right, you know, parameters of, of, of the rules? Yes, we do. Is it possible for them to do that all the time? No, it's not because they're human. They get jaded just like everybody else, just like me. And, and that was kind of where I was pushing it with the jaded. With you, jaded as I've heard guys say when they come back, and you talked about the fall of Afghanistan and things like mm -hmm. that, where they go, what the fuck did I just do all this for? Like, <laughs> I lost all trust in our, and I'll be completely honest with you, I completely lost trust in my country's leadership when that happened and I have not regained it. But even more than that, I think that when you look at it and, and you look back on why did I do all that? 
don't you start second guessing your life choices? A hundred percent. You're like, what in the hell was all of that for? And the way that I, I rationalize it for myself. Um, and, and someone helped me to come to this conclusion because I was having a hard time doing it on my own. Like I said, when we pulled out of Afghanistan, like it all came back to the surface and I was reminded why I was jaded and why I was pissed off and I lost faith in our, our nation's leadership and all of this stuff. And, and one of my buddies, you know, was sitting in, in Danny's here in Coronado, uh, this, one of the seal bars here. Um, and he looked over at me because I'm sitting there and I'm just as pissed off as he is. And we're both drinking a couple of beers. And he looked over at me and he goes, you know what, bro? But we will always have those times. Always. And I looked over at him and I knew exactly what he meant. And I said, you know what, man, you're right. And I have to think about it that way. Um, again, the good, the bad, and the ugly. My career in the SEAL teams was a dream. Um, and I wouldn't be where I am in life today if I hadn't walked that path. So I might not agree with how some of this has turned out, but it was my path and, and, and I walked it and I enjoyed it. What do you think the most scared you've ever been? And, and it can be for the, anything. Yeah. Oh no, I know, I know exactly the day, <laughs> the most scared I have ever been. Um, it was in the summer of 2014. I was a platoon chief at SEAL Team 1. And I was in uh, Baraki Barak District, Logar Province, Afghanistan, with my platoon. I was in charge tactically. And we had gone out and done an op super early that morning uh, that turned it, it was it was it was a banger. I mean, like it was man, it was so much fun. We killed a lot of bad dudes that day. Um, we dropped a lot of bombs that day, exactly where they were supposed to go. Um, we were battlefield effective. It was awesome. And the mission went so well that um, the Special Operations Task Force commander called us over to Fob Shank and said, hey, I, I need y'all to drive over here and, and debrief me on this mission. Because I, I just watched you like Winchester and AC-130 gunship. <laughs> You did like 15 gun runs. Like we could hear all the gunfire from the base. Like we knew you guys were getting after it. Like get over here and roger that, sir. We're going to go do it. And so after we briefed the SOTIF commander, and I'll, I'll tell this part of the story just because it's stupid. Um, and, and it's funny when I look back on it. So we briefed the SOTIF commander and my, uh, my OIC and I, Scotty Reynolds, who's one of my best friends to this day, we come out of the meeting and we're looking around for our boys and we go, Hey, like we got to wrap this up. We got to go like sun starting to set. We don't want to be on route Georgia when the sun sets, like, where is everybody load up? Let's go. And we can't find a fire team of dudes four dudes. And we're like, what, you know, where are these guys? Uh, and then all of a sudden somebody goes, Hey chief, we're ready. We're up. We got everybody. Let's go. And so I said, okay, so we get in the vehicles, we load up. Route Georgia is the only way into the Tangy Valley. It is the only way out. This is the same stomping ground where I just lost Johnny and Kevin on Extortion 17 just three years before that. I mean, literally the same stomping ground, the same little mouth of this valley. And so it was a very, very dangerous place. And there's one route in, one route out. And so as we are traveling back northwest uh, up into the valley to get to our little combat outpost, which is about it's probably about a 30 minute drive just because it's a lot of big vehicles. You got to drive slow. There's bombs, blah, 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 blah. We get past a hairpin turn that was the one that really made me nervous was the one like, hey, they're going to ambush. It's probably going to be right here. And so I kind of relax a little bit. and I'm thinking, oh, man, I think we're out of the woods. And so all of a sudden, uh, somebody comes on the radio and goes, hey, we got to stop the convoy. We just lost a popcorn maker. And I, what? What are, you, what are you talking about? Apparently, the four guys in the fire team were missing because they were commandeering a popcorn machine <laughs> that, were, that was in one of the hooches over at the Soda's base. <laughs> and they had strapped this thing to the back of one of our vehicles, and apparently it come off. Right as the popcorn machine comes off, and I'm trying to figure out in my head, I'm computing what's going on. I am sitting in the, the front passenger seat 
of vehicle number uh, five in the convoy, I think. Um, and vehicle number, no, I'm sorry, vehicle number three. Vehicle number two right in front of me in the front passenger seat is Scotty, my OIC, one of my best friends. And as I get on the radio to go, what the hell are you guys talking about? I see an RPG impact the top of the vehicle, right on top of the gun mount. And fortunately, it wasn't the kind of gun mount where I had a gunner up there outside of the vehicle. Uh, it was a, a mechanized 50 cal where guys were controlling it from a computer inside the vehicle. Um, but this must have been the goddamn sniper of RPGs because, I mean, that 50's gone. Nailed it. And the only thing that saved uh, the guys in that vehicle was that the dude loaded the wrong round in the RPG. If he had loaded an AT round, like every one of my boys in that vehicle would have been smoked. It probably would have been one of the worst days of my career. But fortunately, they were okay. But that initiated probably that was the worst ambush I have ever been in in my entire life. And I've been in some nasty ambushes and that took the cake. When I say that it, it was scary, I mean like there were dudes running out of the huts, running out of the trees, like 10, 15 yards from our vehicles, just like spraying, like it's so close that it's like, oh, you kind of got to get out of the vehicles to fight these dudes, but you, you don't want to get out of the vehicles that that would be stupid. It, it was really, really nasty. And when the fight started, uh, we had two Afghani vehicles, Afghani uh, military commando vehicles in front of us. As usual, as soon as the shooting started, those dudes bailed, bailed, left the vehicles right there in the middle of the road, blocking route Georgia. We couldn't even, like everybody just blow through, keep going. We couldn't even keep going. They literally blocked the road in the middle of an ambush and ran and left. Um, so we had no choice but to get out of the vehicles. And, and that was that was the day I knew in my heart one of my men was going to die. And it scared me more than I've ever been scared in my whole life. And fortunately, I got all the boys back. We, we fought our way out of there. We were okay. Then none, none of the vehicles went down. We, we fixed the, the gun there. Everything was fine. I went back uh, and I called on my boys together because some guys had done some things that I thought they should have thought through a little bit more and, and they were lucky and they got away with some stuff. And I'll be completely honest with you, bro. I pulled my boys together in a room and I talked to them about what was on my heart and I cried like a baby right there in front of them. And I told them how I felt. I said, you guys have no idea how much you scared the shit out of me. Do you know how many of my friends are dead already? Most of you are brand new guys. You think you're fucking invisible now because we've been on this pump for about four months. We've killed a bunch of bad people. We've been lucky in some cases. We got away with some stuff. We've been really, really good. Um, and so you're complacent. And let me just tell you about some of my friends, some of the teammates that went before you that are dead now. Dudes that were 10 times better of an operator than I will ever be. And they're dead now. And they were good. And it worked. It absolutely worked. Um, it was like I gave some of the other older dudes permission to get stuff off their chest. And, and I looked up and every one of the dudes that were my age, my seniority, every one of those dudes was in tears. And one by one, they just started talking about the dude that they remember and that they'll never forget and how he was so much better than him and he still died, you know? And so you guys gotta be tied on. Um, and, and that was that day was the most afraid I've ever been in my entire life. And again, it wasn't because I was a, I was scared I was going to get hurt. It was because I knew in my heart, like, all right, I know this is it. This is the day one of my guys is going to die. And I also knew that there was a pretty good chance that if that happened, it would be signing my death warrant as well, uh, because to this day. I think I know in my heart that I just, I don't think I would have been able to live with the death of one of my guys. Um, I have teammates that are, are walking that path and I see how it's affected them and my heart is broken for them. And I know that they'll never recover from it because they love those dudes that much. Uh, that's how much you love your brothers and your sisters when you're at war. It's the one thing we all got in common. We're all on the same side. There is no greater bond in, in my opinion. But that was the day I was more afraid than I've ever been in my life. And it was because I was afraid of losing one of my best friends. 
I'm glad you brought that up because 2014, that was your worst deployment of all. It was your last deployment, but it was the bloodiest, the most fighting, yep. all yep. of those different things. When you talk about if that would have gone that way, it would have signed your death warrant. I'm glad you brought that up because we need to talk about transition. We need to talk about how people are dealing with stuff that you have been able to go through. Now, here's the interesting part to me. You see there when you talk to everybody, guys cry, guys get it off their chest. It really helps them out. It gets that stuff out there. So why don't we do it all the time? Why don't we tell these stories all the time? Why don't we get that off our chest and let people know who gives a shit if people think that they need to hear the story? These stories need to be heard. So why aren't we telling them all the time? I think we've done it wrong, to be honest with you. I, I think that at least in the special operations community, we have harped so much on being the quiet professional, being the humble warrior, that we've ignored the fact that, yeah, but our, our, our quiet, badass professionals, they're still humans. Like, that, like they, they break just like everyone else. Um, and whereas normal people, sometimes they get scars. You can see these guys, they're, they're scarred up. You just can't see them. Again, we harp so much on operational security and like, we're not going to talk about what we do at all uh, to the point where it becomes, it, it, it's to our detriment. And then in the military, the culture is to drink booze, override and ignore continue mission. That is the culture, make no mistake. And it's very, very strong. And when you're in the military, it feels really, really good. When, 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 you're, at, when you're in the department, you know, you're surrounded by all these other cops that are just like you. It feels really, really good. But then when it goes time for you to put the badge down and take the uniform off and go over here, you have to look up and go, hey, man, there's a whole bunch of stuff that worked for me in that season of my life that is not going to work for me in this next season. And I need to identify those things so that I can leave them back here. There's a bunch of good stuff I'm going to take with me, too, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that I have to leave back here if I want the next season of my life to be as successful or more successful uh, than the last season of my life was. And, and alcohol was certainly one of those things for me uh, that I had to leave behind. And I, I, I don't like, I'm not like a cold turkey. I don't drink alcohol at all anymore. I just, I just rarely do it now. Like I've got to be doing something with somebody or going to some event uh, to do it uh, because that stuff was killing me. And I, I think that we, we, not society, not, no, no, we, the veterans, the service members, the first responders, the, the current and the retired law enforcement officers and military members and, and first responders, we, the, 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 the men and women that, that have spent time in the arena and some of those that are still in the arena, I think it's going to be up to us to go to our brothers and sisters and go, hey, that's wrong. We need to change that. We need an update. We, we have to talk about this stuff. You know why? Because the people that wrote that doctrine on, on about never talking about this shit and you don't talk about what you do and you don't share it with your family and blah, 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 blah. Guess what? They never did any of that shit. Okay. Like when I was going through SEAL training, I think one of my instructors had combat experience. One. Uh, some of those guys went to combat with, with me for the very first time. And so we've learned some stuff. And so we have to evolve if we want to solve this problem. Because I think the problem is that we haven't really evolved. When you look back at history and the men and women coming home from World War II, greatest generation in the history of this country, in my humble opinion, those veterans were coming home. We didn't even have a name for PTSD. Back then, people were calling it battlefield fatigue or, or combat fatigue or battlefield trauma and all this stuff. We didn't even have a name for the scientifically proven chemical imbalance that happens in your brain once you experience certain types of traumatic events. And so you fast forward and we're not figuring out why these people coming home from World War II are jacked up and then Vietnam kicks off. And now we've compounded the problem 10, maybe 20 X. And the result is we look up and you 10 years later, the homeless problem in the United States of America is worse than, than it had ever been in history. And, and, and a lot of these men and women 
are veterans. These are people that have served this country that are now hooked on drugs and sleeping on the streets because as a society, America just chewed them up and spit them out. And so I think it's up to us in the community to go to our brothers and sisters and go, hey, we have to help ourselves. We need to rewrite this doctrine. If you keep holding all this stuff in, it is going to poison you and rot you from the inside. Because I think that's what some of those experiences are. And I think that's what they do. We go and we experience that stuff that human beings were not meant to experience. And then it festers in you. And you're not allowed to talk about it unless you're talking to one of your friends that was there, right? Outside of that, you're, you're just going to drink and you're going to keep it to yourself. And your wife and your kids and your friends and, and your, the rest of your family, they're not going to know why you're being a freaking asshole because you're not allowed to talk about stuff that is hurting you. It's harming you. It is poisoning you from the inside because maybe your conscious brain isn't telling you this, but, but your subconscious brain and whatever that's in your heart that believes in God and Jesus is telling you that, hey, some of that, like maybe it was wrong. There was something about it that was wrong. Is it normal? Something is telling you that, hey, I need to get this out of me. Call it a confession, whatever you want to call it. I don't know, but I have to talk about it. And if you don't talk about it, well, I mean, man, the result is 22, 23 of our friends every day kill themselves. So yeah, we, 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 have to, we have to combat this problem. And I think it starts with us going to one another and saying, hey, we need to talk. I'm glad you said that because here was my next point that I was going to ask. Let's play devil's advocate one final time. Yep. There's a lot of buzzwords. There's a lot of people talking about, yeah, we need to do this and we need to do that. Why aren't we doing it? Because we're not. Brother, I will be the first to tell you, I think the priorities of this country are jacked up beyond measure. I think the priorities of this country are totally jacked up. Okay. Like I, I so it, a very easy example for me to use, and I always throw this one out there and I always want to be careful when I do it because uh, again, I love sports and athletes just like everyone else. And this isn't me saying this against any athlete, but it makes me feel some kind of way, man, when, you know, like LeBron James is a billionaire, you know, and like I, I know former SEALs that are sleeping on the goddamn streets now. Like that pisses me off, you know, like that. that's how jacked up our priorities are in this country. We've got homeless people sleeping on the streets in a first world country that is the greatest country on the planet where a kid from can grow up poor in East St. Louis, Illinois, and, and own a house in Coronado, San Diego, right? But we got homeless people sleeping on the streets. Meanwhile, we're how much money have we sent to U Ukraine, bro? Billions of dollars. And again, this isn't, I know the problem is more complex and it's very easy for me to armchair quarterback it and go, oh, I would never do that. I, I understand that. But what I'm saying is our priorities are not aligned if we have people sleeping in the streets in our own country some cities are being taken over by homeless encampments like cities like san francisco like my friends are like oh my god it's just lost i'm like really a city in the united states of america lost it's gone but we're sending billions of dollars to ukraine we've sent probably trillions of dollars to iraq and afghanistan over the last two decades I think our priorities are jacked up. Um, and I think that if we sit back and wait for our government that has gotten way too big, in my opinion, full of very selfish people that don't really care about the people, this problem will never be solved. We're going to be waiting forever. But let's talk about you and me and the other veterans and the other first responders and stuff like that. Let's, let's leave all that stuff out of it. Let's leave the government out of it. Let's leave all mm -hmm. that. Why is there so little education on it? Why is there a suicide rate that is astronomical right now? And everyone seems to be scratching their head trying to figure out why well, I don't know why it's happening. There's a reason why it's happening. It may not yeah. be, blatant and right out in your face, but I almost think sometimes it is the pressure cooker that is gone on for 10, 15, 20 years with veterans, 10, 15, 20 mm -hmm. years with law enforcement. 
It never goes away. And no one's trying to figure out how to take the pressure cooker away a little. They're trying to figure out how to clamp down on it even more, get more blood from that turnip. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and I don't like it. I think that we have to be, as an individual, we have to be realistic and understand that like, hey, me as an individual person, like I can only do so much. There's only so much of the battle space that I can personally affect, but make no mistake, some of it, I can personally affect it. And for me, uh, it comes by way of first and foremost, I don't even know exactly how I did it, to be honest with you. I've got a bunch of ideas that I don't wanna waste your time with, but the very first thing that, that we have to do is, is raise our hand and admit that, hey, something's going on, right? Like, I, I am not the person that I was when you know, I was 17, 18 years old, joining the military. I am someone else now. Doesn't mean that I'm, I'm a bad person or that is wrong, but I'm someone else now. Um, so there might be some stuff that I need some help with. I need to talk to somebody about it. Um, and, and it's gonna be hard for me to break that because people have been telling me for the last two decades not to talk to anybody about it, but I have to find the courage to do that as an individual, step number one. And I think also as an individual, like we have to, like we have to do our very best to, to just reach out and touch our friends. You know, we, we have to do our very best. And I say it that way because I am just as guilty as everyone. Uh, if you look up and a month or two has gone by and I'm like, gosh, I haven't even talked to my best friend in the whole world in two months. I've been that busy with life, being a husband, a dad, a CEO, a leader, like all this other stuff. And you look up, you're like, oh my God, where did all that time go? And you're like, gosh, I, I haven't even talked to my best friend in the whole world. And it's been a couple of months. So I'm just as guilty as everyone else, but I'm hard on myself when I get that way. And I try to really, you know, pick myself up and go like, no, no, call, no, Ty, call him right now. Don't talk about how you're going to call him this weekend. No, do it right now. And I, even I'm getting a lot better uh, myself about doing that, about just, you know, picking like, Hey man, I was about to shoot you a text, but I said, fuck it. I'm calling you. How you doing? You okay? You got anything you want to talk about? Like, is everything going okay? What's up with your family? And, and I'm being, uh, again, I'm, I'm being a lot more intrusive these days. Uh, when it comes to my friends and just reaching out and going, hey, y'all, let's get together. Is everybody doing okay? Like I have a signal group um, that I'm a part of with with my former SEAL platoon, the guys that I went through all that stuff with in 2014. I'm Gosh, bro, I retired in 2016. And like earlier today, I was talking to those guys in that group. Like we talk almost every day. And even if I'm not like checking that out to make sure they're okay every week, you know, at least a couple times a month, we're like, hey, what's going on? Let me read through. Everybody's okay. Yeah, well, what's up with that? Let me call so and so again, just to make sure. I did it last night where two of my guys were just, hey, I haven't heard from those two dudes in a little bit. Let me just send them a text and make sure they're okay. Like, hey, you guys all right? You want to get on the phone tomorrow? I would challenge all of you um, to try to do that at least once a week. Because all of us do that, right? Where we think like, oh, I wonder how so-and-so is doing. I got to call him or I got to call her. And then you go back to doing and, and you forget. So I challenge you that if one of your brothers or sisters, you know, crosses your mind and you're like, pick up the phone right now and call them. Even if it's just to say, hey, you, you crossed my mind. I just want to take 10 seconds to say, I love you. I miss you. You're doing okay. I wanted you to know I was thinking about, yeah, bro, you heard me right. I fucking love you. You're my brother. I care about you. Are you okay? Is there something we need? I'll get on a plane right goddamn now. Do we need to talk about something? Um, but we have to go that extra mile and we have to do that for one another. Because again, I think if we wait for people to do it for us, um, we're not going to get there. And the last thing I'll say about that is I started out with saying that, hey, as an individual, first, I have to admit that maybe there's something wrong here. You, you, sh you should probably talk to someone about this. So I'll close it out by saying, now you gotta go talk to somebody about this stuff. And I practice what I preach. Every week I talk to my executive coach, a few times a week, every week, at least once a week, I talk to my therapist, I have a spiritual advisor, um, and I've gotten really big into journaling. 
And this is, again, this is stuff that like nobody makes me do this. I pay, I pay for this stuff. Yeah, all of the above, you know, like, and I pay for these people to spend time talking with me to try to work out some of this stuff in my head so that every day I, I just get a little bit better. I'm, I'll never be a normal human being again, and that's okay. I don't want to be normal again. I don't ever want to lose my edge again. Sometimes you need, you need your ego. I like to keep one foot in the gunfighting world, if I say it correctly. Uh, but I do want to be a happy person and I want to be pleasant for other people to be around me. I want to have good energy. So I think it's important that each of us takes the initiative on our own to go, hey, I, yeah, I could, I could talk to somebody. Like, even if it doesn't work out for me, I can try this therapist thing or I can try this psychologist thing you know, just to see if it helps me a little bit. We have to open up our minds a little bit. That's all. Because again, if we wait for other people to do it for us, it's, it's not going to come. I think we should round out this conversation by talking about being a voice for those that can't speak. You talk about it a lot. Education wise, like we said, the boards that you set on, the things that you're trying to do to help veterans have a better way. Let's talk about being a voice for those that can't speak. Yeah, and thank you so much for, for giving me the opportunity to do that. And I want to do it in a couple different ways. First and foremost, you know, I run a venture capital backed generative artificial intelligence company called ComSafe AI. And what we do at ComSafe is we provide uh, large enterprises with artificial intelligence that helps them to mitigate communication risks. So things like sexual harassment racial discrimination, bullying, threats of self-harm and harm to others. Our technology also helps them to mitigate the risk of financial compliance risk, things like price fixing, kickbacks in an organization, cartel forming in an organization. And it was really, really important um, for us to build this company. This is my second business. And, and the first business was a tech-enabled security consultancy where, again, we were, surprise, surprise, protecting people. And uh, we were fairly successful with that company. Um, and in ComSafe AI, you know, we wanted to take a very similar mission and, hey, we protect people. That is who we are. That is our mission. We protect people. And there are a lot of people out there that for whatever reason, don't have the ability to protect themselves. They don't have the voice needed to protect themselves, to go to someone that will listen and do something about it and say, hey, this person said this to me and this is how it's made me feel or this is what's happening to me in my workplace and it makes me really uncomfortable coming to work or i overheard so and so talking about you know all the stuff that she's got going on at home and then and i think she said she's about to lose her house and and she said something about wishing she could go to sleep and never wake up again those people deserve to be protected even if they don't have the voice to tell us that they deserve to be protected. That is who I am inherently, brother. I am a protector of people. I think that's why God put me on this planet. And I think that for, you know, however messed up way you look at it, I, I also think that that's why I've gone through a lot of the things that I've gone through in my life. Uh, it's because God was sculpting me into the protector that I am today. And that's exactly what we do at ComSafe. We protect people, especially people that don't have a voice. Now, I also think it's really important to, to talk about, you know, and, and we kind of scratched the surface on, on this earlier, um, but I also want to talk about that voice that's inside of every one of us that deserves some protection too, brother. Even that, that little voice that's inside of you. Every one of us has whatever age for me that little dude is 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 seven years old going on eight that that's how old i was when my mom married my stepfather there should have been somebody around protecting that little dude making his life a little bit better right but there wasn't uh at least you know not to my liking when i i look back on it and so i spend a significant amount of my time now you know, and I was talking about ego earlier, working on my own ego and learning how to control my ego. And one of the reasons why I am so adamant about that is because 
of the work that I've been doing with my own therapist over the last several years. And it's brought me to a place in my life where I realized, hey, man, a lot of who you are, a lot of the way that you behave, the way you think, the way you carry yourself, a lot of that chip that's on your shoulder, you know, especially, you know, and that chip was, it might as well have been a goddamn tree. It was so big when you left home and joined the military and you were this, this kid just trying to get out of all this stuff, right? Um, a lot of that comes from those experiences that started when you were that seven-year-old little kid. And I've been doing a tremendous amount of, of writing about that. And I think it's really, really important that, that we as a society start looking at one another differently. And I don't know if this works for me because it's something that I've really sort of taken ownership of because again, I'm trying to be a better person you know, I went through a lot when I was retiring from the SEAL teams. You know, I, I went like, gosh, I almost got divorced again. You know, like I, I nearly completely destroyed my relationship with my son. You know, um, like I, I pushed certain family members away just because I, I become, I become a monster. You know what I mean? I had become a monster. I had become exactly who the Navy needed me to be in Iraq and Afghanistan. The problem was, is that by the time I got to the end of my career, somewhere along the lines, I forgot how to turn that switch off, man, you know? And so it, it turned me into, it turned me into a monster. It did. Um, and as a result, where I am now is, is I'm trying to fix a lot of that stuff. And a part of me fixing it I think at the center of it is me gaining control of my ego. And in, in doing a, a lot of this, this, this introspection, um, something that's worked for me is when I communicate with people now, and it's very strange and I know it sounds funny, but even when talking to you, a lot of the times, like I'm looking at you and, and I'm not really, I'm not trying to, I'm not, I, I, it's like I'm looking beyond what I see, right? And I've always done that with, when it comes to people. Like, I don't care what people look like, you know, like I, I'm black, my wife's white, like, like who cares, right? But I'm, I'm not looking at like, I, there's this big strong dude in front of me anymore. It's like, no, man, there's a little kid in that dude that went through some shit when he or she was growing up and we, and there's levels to shit, right? Like we, some of us have had it worse than, than others. There's people had it way worse than I had it, right? Um, but there's a little kid in there that went through some stuff and that little kid is, is simply trying to understand what the hell is going on right now. That's all that's happening. That kid is trying, they're, they're just trying to understand. Um, and it has been tremendously helpful for me because the Navy taught me how to view that grown person standing in front of me pushing back on whatever it was I was saying or doing, the Navy did a really good job of teaching me to, instead of seeing that little kid, I see a nail. That's what I see, a nail. And the Navy turned me into a goddamn sledgehammer, right? Um, and so I've had to train that out of me and realize that, hey, that's not a nail. That, that's a person, and even more important, there's a little kid. Because it's, it's the little kid and that person that's gonna get hurt or be offended when that person walks away and they're pissed off. It's not the grown, we don't act like grown ups when we get pissed off, we act like little kids, right? It's the little kid in that person that you should have been actively trying to protect during that conversation, even though that person was pushing back on whatever you were saying or blah, 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 blah. And that has been tremendously helpful for me. And, and I'm gonna continue to do that because again, I realize in me, that the asshole I had become, it started with that little seven-year-old kid getting beat up by a stepdad and just trying to figure out why the hell it was happening. So let me ask you, are you worried that that monster is always lurking around the corner? Am I worried about it? No. Do I know that monster is always lurking around the corner? Yes. And so you're taking preemptive measures then to keep it at bay? Or is there a chance that it could rear its ugly head just because you're not on your game, maybe. No, I control the monster now. That's why I work so hard on my ego 
and reserving my criticisms and my judgment for myself, or at least I try to, uh, because I have a say in when that monster rears its ugly head. I don't need that monster rearing its ugly head because my wife said something that pissed me off. But if somebody's coming in my house in the middle of the night and my wife and my daughter are sleeping here, make no mistake, they're going to meet that monster. Right. right. So I don't ever I don't ever want to completely get rid of that monster. Uh, but it is my responsibility, mine, to take control of that monster and go like, hey, like, no, no, I under OK, I understand why you feel that way, because he just said that and yet yeah, pissed me off, too. Right. So I understand why you feel that way. But I, I need you to stand right here for right now and understand that he said that because he's scared or insecure about something in there. He just hasn't shared it with you yet. So hang out right there. No, 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 don't leave because I might need you. Right. But just hang out right there and let me finish working this out. And then I'll decide if I need you or if you can go get back in the bed. Um, because honestly, I, I think that monster is my ego. Well, and, and that's what I was going to say. So do you think all those years, and this is kind of the, the final coup de gras question is, do you think that monster controlled you for all those years? Yes, I do. But here, but here's the thing, <laughs> because the answer to that question is absolutely yes. And this is two sided. First and foremost, that monster, that monster is also the reason why I'm as successful as I am today, right? That monster was controlling me, but but yeah, that it's also the reason why I have imposter syndrome and it's and it's never good enough. I gotta go get one more degree or build one more thing or because I just don't want to be like my biological dad, you know what I mean? So again, I, I never want to completely kill it, but the monster was controlling me and and you need some of that. And the last part about that that I'll say is I also think that I also think a lot of that is normal when you look at men like you and I and women too, right? There's a lot of alphas out there. My wife is an alpha. She isn't as alpha as a woman can be. My, my, and I mean it. My wife is literally the head of brain surgery for Scripps in San Diego, like the top dog, right? Uh, so she is as alpha as, as a woman can be. Right. So I think that that's also a part of who we are. Like it takes a, a special kind of person um, to like it absolutely takes a special kind of person uh, to go. Sign me up. I'll go. I'll go on a harm's way. No, oh, I know I might not come back, but somebody's got to do it. And you see these people over here. I love them more than you could ever imagine. I would light a goddamn city on fire for them. I've done it for less. So if it's a matter of one of them going or me going, sign me up, send me, I'll go. It takes a different kind of person to do that, right? And so I, I, I think that that is also something about us, people that, that end up in these roles in the military as first responders. It's kind of like a double-edged sword, you know what I mean? Like, like again, because like sometimes you need that and it makes you as successful and as aggressive um, and as badass as you need to be in some of those situations. But like, yeah, it gets us in trouble sometimes too. Your piece of advice. You got one piece of advice to give to somebody. Pick your best one in your toolbox. What do you give to people? These are not my words. This is advice that someone, another veteran uh, gave me as I was starting my first company. Um, and he said to me, Ty, your success as an entrepreneur is going to be based on your ability to become comfortable having uncomfortable conversations. And I don't think I've, I've been given more accurate advice in my entire life, uh, especially because, again, with all of this, this introspection I've practiced over the last several years, I've expanded that beyond entrepreneurship. Like, no, man, that's life in general. If you want to be successful in life, you had better become comfortable having uncomfortable conversations. And, and, and when I say you better become comfortable doing it again, realize that there's a little kid in the person that's sitting across from you having that uncomfortable conversation with you. And they just want to understand. And maybe it's up to you to take the higher road and go, Hey, maybe I have to communicate in a way that allows this person to understand, yeah, it's going to practice my patience. It's going to be hard for me, 
But if I take the higher road and do that, maybe I'm teaching them something. And then when I'm brushing my teeth, looking at myself in the mirror at the end of the night before I get in the bed, I don't want to look away. I can look at that person in the mirror and go, I know that I protected that little person that was in on the inside of that person. If you want to be successful in life, you had better become comfortable having uncomfortable conversations because we don't do that with ourselves anymore. We don't talk to one another anymore. And it's very easy to just point the finger and blame and again, go all black people or all cops or all white people. It's like, hey, how about we sit down and talk? I know it's gonna hurt, but how about we sit down and talk and try to just understand one another. And it's gonna be uncomfortable, but we have to have this uncomfortable conversation. Well, I think you've lived pretty much your whole life being comfortable in uncomfortable situations from your entire career to what you're doing now to be an entrepreneur, to kind of being out there and being the face of this next generation that's gonna come up. So. Let's talk about where people can find you, social media, anywhere else that they want to look into your story. Of course, it'll be on the episode page, but if they want to do it tonight before the episode comes up. Yeah, please check us out at www.comsafe.ai. That's C-O-M-M-S-A-F-E dot A-I. And I personally am also very active on LinkedIn. You can check out my LinkedIn profile at Ty Smith forward slash 31 on LinkedIn. Uh, and that is all of the social media that I am on because like a lot of military and law, uh, you know, first responders, uh, we don't like our information just being out there in the ether for everybody to have access to. So look me up on LinkedIn and I'd be happy to chat. Fortunately, running a podcast, you have to have all kinds of social media. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, guys, now you know where you can find Ty. Let's talk about where you can find me. As always, you can find me on Instagram at the DTD underscore podcast. You can find me on Facebook at the DTD podcast. And you can find me on YouTube where all these conversations, they're in video form. But your one-stop shop, that's going to be DTDpodcast.net. It's got audio. It's got video. Ty has his own episode page. It's got pictures of him. It's got links to where you can find him and let you know a little more of his story. So make sure you stop by there, DTDpodcast.net. Now that we've talked about me, let's talk about the people that make this show happen every single week. Mac belts and police coffee. We all know that nothing stands up to wear and tear like a good leather belt. If you're looking for the toughest leather belt on earth, then you've come to the right place. Mac belts. They're handcrafted in the USA by veterans who are serious about their craft. And if you're looking for a belt that's tough enough for your active lifestyle, then support these guys. They've given so much back to our country. And look no further than Mac Belts. It's the toughest belt on the planet. It's hand cut, veg tan, full grain saddle leather dyed to a classic saddle tan. And I'm telling you, Mac Alexander over there, retired Navy SEAL, he's doing it right. He's putting out these belts. I have two of them. I wear one every single day. They're the most amazing belt that I've ever had. Make sure you go to MacBelts.com. Check them out. Now let's talk about coffee. Police Coffee is an officer-owned business, and it's dedicated to crafting the finest coffees and blends, and they're shipped as soon as they're made to provide you with the freshest coffee available. Each batch is roasted fresh by people who know what it means to stay vigilant, and their specialty coffees do not waste one drop when flavor is concerned. Their coffee's some of the best you'll find, but it helps serve an important cause. They give back to our community. 50% of their profits go towards helping family members of police officers who fell in the line of duty. And as always, my favorite flavor, One Ranger. It's sweet, pecan, buttery, nutty. However you want to say it, it cuts right through the acidity of coffee, and I absolutely love it. So if you go to policecoffee.com, they have whole bean, ground, K-cups. They have dog treats. They have coffee mugs. Anything that you'd need to drink your coffee. And don't forget, DJK10 will give you 10% off your order. Guys, make sure you go buy these sponsors. They really make this show happen. MacBelts.com, PoliceCoffee.com. That's going to be it for this week, Ty. You have an amazing story. I'm so glad you're out there telling everyone. That's it. Guys, that's Ty. I'm DJ. Catch us on the next one. We're out of here.